All right, welcome to the Evolved Educator podcast. I'm Jennifer. I'm Michelle. I'm John Me. <laughs> okay, so I have a question for you guys. Can you think of some misconceptions, some common misconceptions that mm -hmm. kids have? One of my favorites, and I really think it's because of cartoons and even some little kid books, that dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. That's common. That's mm -hmm. the Flintstones, right? <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, yes. And I have a good, another good one. Columbus and the Pilgrims arrived around the same time. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's another good one. And I'm sure, you know, there's so many of them. Um, you ask any teacher, they probably can tell you lots of examples. Um, and maybe even, you know, tell you why kids have misconceptions like this or, or how they started. So that brings us to our segment today. All hexagons are not yellow. Mmm, funny. What? Mind blown. <laughs> All those pattern blocks. <laughs> yes. Before we start, let's let's just explain what is misconception. What do we mean by that? Right. That's important. So, any prior knowledge that that the child is coming to school with that's either illogical or erroneous or misinformed. Okay. So we know, you know, students come to school, they're not blank slates. They, they are coming with lots of experiences and language and culture and, and all that stuff. So misconceptions are inevitable and it's, it's a normal part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. we, we know yes. this, but yes. how can teachers kind of address these misconceptions and make their instruction more effective? Well, mm -hmm. um, what we do know about research is that it shows that students' learning and achievement increases when the teachers better understand the student thinking. So like that's at the heart of overcoming misconceptions. So we need to understand that when students have some prior knowledge that's consistent with the curriculum being taught, we're just adding to what they already know. Mm -hmm. But with misconceptions, this prior knowledge that's incorrect, teachers have to change what the students think and believe that they know. And that mm -hmm. is way more challenging than just adding to something because mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. we have to convince them of something that they thought mm -hmm. this whole time. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So they believe something to be true and now it, if they're finding out it's not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Yes. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just be like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> it's not going to work. Wait, you can't? You can't do yeah. that? Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Okay. So when, when teachers do understand their students' thinking, though, it increases their own knowledge because those misconceptions that teachers, uh, that students have can make the teachers think differently about the topic. True. So teachers can expand their thinking or modify their own practices based on the students' misconceptions, and that's, that's a big part of our own professional growth. So adjusting misconceptions does benefit everyone, both the students and the teachers. So what can teachers do to consistently deal with this issue with student misconceptions and make their instruction more effective? Very deliberate planning. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the environment that you set up, mm -hmm. um, creating sort of the student-centered environment um, where the, you know, the learning is really authentic. They're solving like real world type problems where the kids are really taking ownership of stuff because then you're, you're giving them opportunities to be able to challenge each other's thinking, even challenge their own thinking. It's not just the teachers sort of regurgitating information saying, okay, what you thought was wrong and this is what I'm telling you is right. Mm -hmm. Kids are figuring that out on their own by challenging each other's ideas. So I think that's a big part of it in really using a lot of questioning and probing about their thinking. Like, like you said earlier, Chami, it's, it's us really understanding where this thinking is coming from mm -hmm. and taking into consideration um, things like language and culture of students, which may, con you know, contribute to a misconception, um, things like that. Another important thing is that we need to always ask our students to give evidence to support their ideas. And then as they're doing that, it get, you know, they, they need to give reason, like they can reason through their misconceptions. You want them to reflect on their learning frequently as they're doing the reasoning as well. So then you're teaching them metacognitive skills as well as knowing that 
that knowledge can evolve. Like ideas do change and grow. Yeah. And we, we know that with research, like we learn more about uh, certain, you know, like Pluto is no longer one of the planets, you know, those sort of right. things to be, right. to be ready to like be able to reason through those things. So I know something that I do is, uh, encourage students to test their ideas and this can be done through like illustrating or modeling or even just writing out a description so that they can uh, process through the the misconception or come up with a, a concept map to connect ideas it, it really helps students figure out their thinking so I, I think I get with the lesson here um, it's that when students come to school with all kinds of knowledge and some of it correct and some of it not, of course. It's our job as teachers to plan for opportunities and experiences that will help students to be able to add to that knowledge or help them to reconstruct or to overcome some of those misconceptions. So Jennifer, time for strategies that get the W. Do you have something fun for us to send off a little goodie? I do. Have you guys ever used uh, uh, can't say it, anticipation guides? Mm, yes. 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 But tell us how to use them. So I, I started using them um, with novels and reading kind of around themes, but now I use them in almost all the subjects, really, when I'm introducing new concepts, you know, putting down several statements, some true, some false, and just kind of seeing what, what kids think, giving them some time to hash it out, and then going, you know, through the unit. But the most important part and the best part is at the end when they revisit the guide. Yes. And listening to those discussions at the end, um, you know, to, to hear them either confirm or reject their sort of original thoughts about mm -hmm. something. So great. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really, I, I think they're a great tool for activating prior knowledge, getting the kids uh, really thinking critically. They're practicing supporting their, their opinions with evidence. Uh, a lot of predicting skills kind of sets a purpose, gets them really excited and curious about things. Mm. Yeah. It helps you as the teacher suss out what are the misconceptions going on. Definitely. And start yes. thinking about how am I going to, yeah, how am I going to deal with these? Yes. Right? Because one year you might have a whole a whole group of kids who think one thing and then the next time around people think different things and you might not have to address those issues the next time. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, anticipation guide is a very good tool for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. So, and I do, I do love it for um, a quick uh, assessment of misconceptions. And then especially, like you said, at the end when the students have gone through everything and then they can compare their initial ideas to the end. Right. It, that's yes. that reflection it, that yes. you were talking about that's just so important. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for listening to our podcast. Have a nice day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.